Chapter Thirty of Delorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirty. The strange interview which I have described, of course, yielded my thoughts sufficient employment. Was it? Could it really be? I asked myself that I had spent the last hour in conversation with the greatest statesman in modern Europe, and in conversation about what? About Ovid the task of a schoolboy in an inferior class when i could have afforded him minute information upon events on which the fate of nations depended could he have received prior information impossible our vessel had sailed with the fairest wind and the speed of our passage had been made a marvel of by the sailors i had lost no time upon the road and it was impossible surely quite impossible that he could have received tidings from catalonia in a shorter space without indeed the devil as the vulgar did not scruple to say sent him tidings from all parts of the world by especial couriers of his own one thing however is certain i went to the palais cardinal a very important person in my own opinion and i came away from it with my self-consequence very terribly diminished my next reflections turned to the minister's very unclerical dress and i puzzled myself for some time in fancying the various errands which might have required such a disguise for disguise it evidently was of course i could conclude upon nothing and was only obliged to end in supposing with the boy who had guided me thither that no one knew how or why he did anything my way home was easily found and retiring to bed i dreamed all night between sleeping and waking of courts and prime ministers and woke the next morning not at all refreshed for having passed the night in such company i had more disagreeable society however before long for when i had been up about an hour and was preparing to go out and view the great and stirring beehive whose hum reached me even in my own cell the worthy host of the auberge bustled into the room with an appearance of great terror begging a thousand pardons for his intrusion but he hoped he said that if i had anything in my bags which i wished to conceal i would put it away quickly for that the officers of justice were in the house and he had heard them inquire for a person very much resembling me of course i laughed at the idea but the landlord had hardly concluded his tale when in rushed two sergeants and a greffier dressed in their black robes of office one stationed himself at the door one threw himself between me and the window and then commanded me in the king's name to surrender myself i replied that i was very willing to surrender but that there must be assuredly some mistake for that i had not been in paris sufficient time to commit any great crime no mistake sir no mistake replied one of the sergeants people who have the knack commit crimes as fast as they eat oysters you are accused sir of filching they say sir you are guilty of appropriation a good man an excellent good man jonas echemilia of the persecuted race of abraham avers against you sir that last night towards ten of the clock you entered his dwelling sir wherein he gives shelter to old servants cast off by ungrateful masters in other words sir his frippery and notoriously and abominably seduced a white silk suit laced with gold to elope with you to the identity of which suit he will willingly swear so open your swallow all or trunk mail and let us see what it contains whilst the worthy sergeant thus proceeded the warning of my good friend the grocer came across my mind and i thought that there was an affectation about the voice of the respectable officer which made me suspect that the whole business might be contrived to extort money though how they could know that i had a white silk dress laced with gold in the valise before me i could not divine however i affected to be very much alarmed and while i examined well the countenances of my honest guests i feigned a wish to bribe them into a connivance not for a hundred pistoles cried the principal sergeant nay nay said the landlord who had remained in the room worthy sergeant you must not be too severe upon my young lodger consider his youth and inexperience echemilia is a tender-hearted man and would not wish you to be hard upon him take a hundred pistoles and let him off 
the sergeant began to show symptoms of a relenting disposition and expressed his pity of my youth and ignorance of the ways of paris with so much tender-heartedness that it overcame my gravity and sitting down upon a chair i laughed till i cried the two sergeants looked rather confounded but the greffier a little man whose risible organs were apparently somewhat irritable could not resist the infectious nature of my laugh but began a low sort of cachination which he unsuccessfully tried either to drown in a cough or stifle in the sleeve of his robe the sympathy next affected the landlord who after looking wistfully first to one and then to another with one eyebrow raised and one corner of his mouth in a grin while the other struggled for gravity for near a minute was at length overpowered by the greffier's efforts to smother his laughter and burst forth shaking his fat sides till the room rang the sergeant at the door tittered but the principal officer affected a fury that soon brought me to myself though in a very different manner from that which he expected starting upon my feet i caught him by the collar and knocking his bonnet off his head exposed to view the very identical person of my hectoring guide of the night before though he had ingeniously contrived to change completely the shape of his face by cutting his immense beard into a small peak shaving each of his cheeks and leaving nothing but a light moustache upon his upper lip scoundrel cried i giving him a shake that almost tore his borrowed plumes to pieces what in the name of the devil tempted you to think you could impose on me with a stale trick like this because you dined at a table d'hote in flemish lace replied the other sergeant continuing to chuckle at his companion's misfortune but come young sir you must let him go though you have found him out and thereupon he threw back his robe and grasped the sword which it concealed as i had imagined my man of war was as arrant a coward as ever swore a big oath and he trembled violently under my hands till he saw his more valiant comrade begin to espouse his cause so manfully he then however thought it was his cue to bully and exclaimed in his natural voice unhand me or by the heart of my father i'll dash you to atoms the devil you will said i seizing the foot he had raised in an attitude calculated to menace me with a severe kick the window was near and open underneath it was a savoury dunghill from the stables at the side the height about twelve feet from the ground so without farther ceremony i pitched the valiant soldado out head foremost and drew my sword upon his companion who ventured one or two passes in the course of which he got a scratch in his arm and then ran downstairs as fast as he could after the landlord and the griffier who had already led the way running to the window however from which i could see over the gate of the court into the street i shouted aloud to the passengers to stop the sham sergeants the first who with my assistance had gone out the shortest way whether he was used to being thrown out of window and did not mind it or whether the dunghill was as soft as a bed of down i know not but by this time had gained his feet and was half way down the street where the griffier had slunk to i cannot say but the more pugnacious personage who had drawn his sword upon me was caught by the people attracted by my cries as he was in the act of making best use of his legs after his arms had failed him it would have given me pleasure i own to bring even one of such a set of impostors to justice but i was disappointed for just as a porter and a vinegar seller were bringing him back to the inn he suddenly shook them off slipped the sergeant's gown over his head and scampered away through a dozen turnings and windings with a rapidity and address which smacked singularly of much practice in running off in a hurry after a hot chase the porter returned to tell me that he could not catch the nimble-limbed cheat and calling him up to my chamber i bade him take up my packages and prepared to leave the house after examining the contents of each valise from which i found nothing missing though sufficiently disarranged to show that they had afforded amusement to others during my absence the night before had they met with the diamonds it is probable that they would have spared themselves and me the trouble of the somewhat operose contrivance to which they had recourse 
but these fortunately placed in the very bottom of the valise with several things of less consequence had escaped their search as we were passing into the court the respectable landlord presented himself cap in hand delivered his account and hoped i had been satisfied with my entertainment and would recommend his house to my friends while all the time he spoke there was a meaning sort of grin upon his countenance as if he could hardly help laughing at his own impudence i answered him somewhat in his own strain that the entertainment was what the reputation of his house might lead one to expect and in regard to recommending it to my friends that it was very possible i should have occasion to visit shortly the criminal left tenant when i would take care to commend it to his notice in the most particular manner and point out its deserts to him with care if faith answered the host calmly i am afraid that the worshipful gentleman of whom you speak will find but poor accommodation at my house and therefore feeling myself incompetent to entertain him as he deserves i would fain decline the honour of his company after having paid my reckoning i betook myself to the shop of the honest grocer who heard my story without surprise and in answer to my inquiry for a lodging he replied that he knew of one nearly opposite to his own house but that he doubted whether it would suit a person of my condition for it was small and kept by an old widow who though very respectable was anything but rich i need not say this was the very sort of situation i desired for after having paid mine host of the rue de Prevert, my purse offered nothing but a long and lamentable vacuity with three louis d'or at the bottom looking as lank and empty when i drew it out of my pocket as an eel-skin just stripped off one of those luckless aquatic st bartholomews i was soon then installed in my new apartment and being left to myself gazed upon my scanty stock of riches as many an unfortunate wretch has doubtless often gazed before me calculating how long each several piece would keep life and soul together and when they were expended what then i asked myself must i then write to my parents confess my attachment to helen own that i murdered her brother take from her mind any blessed doubt that might still remain upon it snap each lingering affection that might still bind her to me in twain at once and at the same time encounter the angry expostulation of my father for loving below my degree as well as the calm reproaches of my mother for having blinded her to that love expostulations and reproaches which for helen's sake i could have encountered while there remained a chance of her being mine but which now i felt no strength to bear no motive to call upon my head oh no no i could not write poverty beggary wretchedness anything sooner than that and starting up i proceeded into the street hoping to drive away thought amongst all the gay sights i had heard of in paris as i passed along the rue saint jacques a beggar asked me for charity and instinctively i put my hand in my pocket when suddenly the thought of my own beggary came upon my mind and with a sickness of heart impossible to describe i drew my hand back saying i had nothing for him do my good lord do cried the mendicant may you never suffer such poverty as mine and if you should for who can tell in this uncertain life and if you should may you never be refused by those you beg of i could refuse no longer it came so painfully home to my own bosom that i gave him a small piece which i had received in change and then walked on feeling as if i had just cast away a fortune instead of giving a piece of a few sols to a beggar oh circumstance circumstance thou art like a juggler at a fair making us see the same object with a thousand different hues as thou offerest thy many-coloured glasses to our eyes passing on i found my way to the palais cardinal where after having gazed for a moment or two at the enormous pile of building before me the thousand minute beauties of which the darkness had hidden from me the night before i mounted the steps to leave my address as i had been commanded the doors of the palace far from being guarded as i had previously found them now seemed open to every one crowds of people of all classes were going in and coming out and every sort of dress was there from the princely justo corps 
whose arabesqued embroidery left scarcely an inch of the original stuff visible to the threadbare pourpoint whose long experience in the ways of the world had rendered it as polished and as smooth as the tongue of an old courtier all was whisper and smiles and hurry and bustle and though every here and there an anxious face might be seen giving shade to the picture no one would have imagined that through these gates issued forth each day a thousand orders of death of misery and of despair i entered with the rest and as the way seemed open to every one was walking on when i soon found that all who passed were known for hardly had i taken two steps across the vestibule when an attendant placed himself in my way asking my business it was easily explained and leading me into a small cabinet adjoining the hall he took down a ponderous folio and desired me to write my address when i opened it i found it quite full and the page took down another wherein at the end of many thousands of names i wrote my own with ink that i doubted would not prove true lesser and turned away even more hopeless than i came spare time now became my curse and joining with a restless and excited spirit drove me through everything that was to be seen in paris with an eagerness which soon exhausted its object day passed by after day and the minister took no notice of me i spun out my meagre funds like the thread of a spider but still every hour i saw them diminish twice each day i sent to the auberge where i had lodged to inquire whether little achilles had yet arrived and still my disappointment was renewed nor was this disappointment one which the least painful of my feelings for in the solitariness of my being in that great city i would have given worlds for his company even although i could neither respect nor esteem him and yet let me not do him injustice mean qualities were so mingled in him with great ones his folly was so strangely mixed with shrewdness and his love of himself so singularly contrasted with the generous attachment which he had conceived towards me that i hardly knew whether to look upon him with regard or contempt yet certainly i longed for his coming and as the days went by and he came not even while i smiled at remembering his poltroonery i could not help hoping that the little coward had met with no obstruction in the road in the meanwhile my frugality served to prolong the sojourn of my three louis in my purse far longer than i could have expected and perhaps my pain with it as seeing them daily decrease it was like the handfuls of couscous coup that they give in morocco to persons dying of impalement the means only of extending moments of misery one day however in passing along the rue saint jacques i saw lying on a bookstall two treatises upon very different subjects one relating to military tactics and the other entitled the sure way of winning or hazard not chance the price of each was but a trifle and in a fit of extravagance i bought them both i had now wherewithal to employ my time and i studied each of these two books with an ardour which had it been employed continuously on any great or important subject might have changed the face of my fortune for ever the treatise on strategy though perhaps not the best that was ever written was at all events no detrimental employment and on it i bestowed one half of my time the other half was given to the sure way of winning which was neither more nor less than an elaborate treatise upon gaming with all the profound calculations of chances necessary to qualify a complete gambler thank god i was not by nature a lover of play or by such a study i should have been irretrievably lost as it was i soon began to look upon the gaming-table as the only resource which fortune held out to me and with indescribable assiduity and application i went through every calculation in the book working them out in my mind hundreds and hundreds of times till their results became no longer matters of arithmetic but of memory three weeks elapsed before i deemed myself qualified to encounter the well-experienced parisians and by this time i had but one louis remaining this i changed into crowns and with an anxious heart proceeded as soon as it was dark to a house where i was informed that the minor sort of gambling in which alone i could indulge was carried on every night 
a narrow dirty passage conducted to a small staircase at the bottom of which i began to hear the voices of the throng above at the top were two men wrangling in no very measured terms and passing on i entered a large room where about twenty tables were set out and most of them occupied a crown was demanded for admission which i paid and then proceeded to examine the various groups that were scattered throughout the room squalid misery devouring passion and debasing vice were written in every countenance i beheld of course the whole assembly were divided between losers and winners of the first some were talking high and angrily some were blaspheming with the insanity of disappointment some were gazing with the silent stupefaction of despair and some were laughing with that ringing soulless mockery of mirth with which vanity sometimes strived to hide the bitterest pangs of the human heart of the winners some were amassing their gains with greedy satisfaction some were smiling with a sneering triumph at the poor folks they plundered and some with the eager falcon eye of avarice were gazing keenly at the rolling dice or turning cards as if they feared that chance might yet snatch their prey out of their talons the whole scene came upon my heart with a sickening faintness that had nearly made me turn and fly it all but at that moment a very polite personage seeing a stranger approached and invited me in courteous terms to sit at one of the vacant tables and try a throw of the dice or if i loved better than more scientific games we would open a pack of cards he said i agreed to the latter proposal and we sat down to piquet he played a bold and more hazardous game i the quiet and more certain one and though some fortunate runs of the card made him eventually the winner my loss was but two crowns one throw with these for what you have lost said my adversary before we rose offering me the dice at the same time we threw and i lost two crowns more we threw again and i was penniless i bore it more calmly than i had expected but i believe it was more the calmness of despair than anything else which supported me however wishing my adversary good night as politely as i could i walked away hearing him say in a whisper to one who stood near he plays very well at piquet that young gentleman it was as much as i could do to beat him beyond a doubt this was meant for my hearing and if so it had its effect for my first thought was what article of my scanty stock i could part with to yield the means of recovering that night's loss the diamonds which achilles had entrusted to me instantly suggested themselves to my mind and the tempter who still lies hid in the bottom of man's heart till passion calls him forth did not fail to suggest a thousand excellent and plausible motives for using them achilles said the devil had himself voluntarily given them to me and even if he had not done so i had just as much a right to them as he had but if my conscience forbade me to take them ultimately it would be very easy to repay the value either when i should have recovered my losses at the gaming-table or when i was restored to the bosom of my family thank heaven however i had honour enough left not to violate a trust reposed in me i had still a diamond ring of my own my mother had given it to me it is true but necessity more strong than feeling required me to part with it and i determined to do so the next morning in looking for it for i had ceased to wear it since i set out from marseilles i met with the packet of papers regarding the count de bagnols which i had almost always kept about me and looking over them i was tempted again to read some of the letters i went on from one to another through the whole correspondence between the count then a very young man and the rebellious rochelois and i found throughout that fine discrimination between right and wrong which is the chivalry of the mind it was a lesson and a reproach but as i had passed to the brink of vice not by the short and flowery path of pleasure but by a road where every step was upon thorns as i had been driven by errors and by accidents rather than led by indulgence the road back seemed not so long as to those who have followed every maze of enjoyment in their course from virtue to vice with me it wanted but one effort of the mind but the moral courage to communicate my true situation to those i loved and i should at once free myself of the enthralment of circumstances 
such reflections passed rapidly through my mind and i resolved to do what i should have done but what are resolutions air the next morning i carried my diamond ring to a most respectable jeweller who bought it of me for one-fifth of its worth and vowed all the while that he should lose by his bargain six louis however now swelled my purse and as night came my good resolutions faded like the waning sunshine the cursed book of games found its way into my hands and at seven o'clock i stood before the same house where i had left my money the night before like the gates of dis the door stood ever open and those feet which had once trod that magic path could hardly cross it without again turning in the same direction on entering the room the society which it contained struck me as even more ruffianly than the night before and i fancied that many eyes turned upon me as on one whose appearance there on the former evening had been remarked my polite adversary was looking on at one of the tables where the parties were playing for louis but the moment his eye fell upon me he came forward and offered me my revenge they are playing too high at that table said he as we sat down to my mind it takes away all the pleasure of the game to have such a stake upon it as would pain one to lose no gentleman ever plays for the sake of winning a great deal of other people's money and therefore he ought to take care that he does not part with too much of his own i play for amusement alone and therefore let us begin with crowns as we did last night his moderation pleased me and opening the cards we again commenced our evening with piquet he again played boldly and i even more cautiously than before but the cards were no longer favourable to my adversary he lost everything and in an hour i had fifty crowns lying beside me half a dozen persons had now crowded round us and all joined in praises of my skilful play too skilful for me i am afraid said my adversary maintaining his good temper admirably though i thought i discovered a little vexation in his tone i own fair sir that you are my master with the cards but you will not refuse me an opportunity of mending my luck with these and he took up the dice boxes the spirit had now seized me i had gained enough to wish to gain more bright hopes of turning fortune's frowns to smiles of freeing myself of all difficulties of rising superior to my oppressive fate began to swim before my eyes and i willingly agreed to his proposal never doubting that my ascendancy would still continue we played on rapidly and soon the pile of coin by my side diminished vanished grew higher and higher on his and with agony of mind beyond all that i had ever felt my golden hopes passed away and despair began to come fast upon me as louis after louis of my last and only resource melted from my touch with the cards all had been fair that was evident enough but now my suspicions began to be awakened in regard to the dice i remembered those which i had split open at Luz, and as i threw i watched narrowly to see whether there was anything in those i played with which might show them to be loaded but no they rolled over and over turning each side alternately as fairly as possible i next fixed my eyes on my adversary when suddenly i saw him with the dexterity of a juggler hold the dice he took up in the palm of his hand and slip two others from the frill round his hand when about to throw again i saw him prepare to perform the same trick and springing up i pinned his hand to the table a loud outcry instantly took place the man's mad what is he about turn him out throw him out of the window cried a dozen voices you shall do it if you like gentlemen cried i provided this man has not two false dice under his hand as i spoke i lifted his hand from the table when to my horror and surprise there were no dice there i was dumb as if thunderstruck and my adversary with ever feature convulsed with rage lifted the hand i had liberated and struck me a violent blow in the face instinctively i laid my hand upon my sword when every one round threw themselves upon me and in the midst of a thousand blows i was hurried to the window and though struggling violently to save myself pitched over into the street End of chapter thirty
Chapter thirty one of De Lorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty one. Luckily, the window from which I was thrown was on the first floor, and not above sixteen feet raised from the ground. My fall, therefore, was so instantaneous that I had no time to indulge in any of the pleasing anticipations of which a journey head foremost from a high window to the ground is susceptible. The fall, however, was sufficient to stun and bewilder me, and before I had well recovered my recollection, I found myself surrounded by a good number of lackeys with torches, who had seen my sudden ejaculation from the gaming-house while they were accompanying some carriage through the streets, and had come to my assistance with many inquiries as to whether I was hurt. I had fallen upon my left shoulder and hip, and my head had, fortunately, escaped without the same sudden contact with the stones, so that, though somewhat confused, I could reply that I believed I was not much injured, but that I could not rise without assistance. "'Help him to rise!' cried a voice, which very much resembled that of the Chevalier de Montenero, "'and give him what assistance you can.' The person who spoke I could not see, but the servants, who had been hitherto gazing at me without lending me any very substantial aid, now hurried to raise me, one taking me by each arm. This proceeding, however, gave me such exquisite pain in my left shoulder, that after a groan or two, and an ineffectual effort to make them comprehend that they were inflicting on me the tortures of the damned, I lost all recollection with the excess of agony. When I recovered my perception of what was passing around me, I found that the servants had procured a kind of brancar, or litter, and having laid me upon it, were carrying me on, I conjectured, to the house of some surgeon. They stopped, however, a moment after, at the entrance of what was evidently a very handsome private hotel, and passing through the porte cochere and the court, they bore me into an immense salle à manger, and thence into a small chamber beyond, where I was carefully laid on a bed, and bade to compose myself as a surgeon had been sent for, and would arrive, they expected, immediately. He was not indeed long, and on examining my side he found that my shoulder was dislocated, but that I had sustained no other injury of consequence. After a painful operation, the process of which I need not detail, I was put to bed, and the surgeon, having given me a draught to procure sleep, and allay the pain I suffered, recommended me to be kept as quiet as possible, and left me. I did not, however, suffer all the servants to quit the room, without inquiring whether I had not heard the voice of the Chevalier de Montenero. The valet replied that he thought I must have been mistaken, for he never heard of such a name in all his life. But as there had been a good many persons round about when I was taken up, it was possible one of these might have spoken in the manner I mentioned. I was now left alone, and I endeavoured to forget as fast as possible, in the arms of sleep, all the unpleasant circumstances round which memory would fain have lingered. It was in vain, however, that I did so. The feverish aching of my bones kept slumber far away. Every noise that stirred in the house I heard, every step that moved along its various halls and passages, seemed beating upon the drum of my ear. I could hear my own blood rushing along my veins and throb in my head, as if Vulcan and all the Cyclops of Etna had transferred their anvils to my brain. While in this state a light suddenly shone through the keyhole and under the door, and I heard several persons enter the dining-hall through which I had been borne thither. Everything that was said reached my ears as distinctly as if I had been present, and I soon found that the principal person who entered was the nephew of the proprietor of the house. He had just returned, it seemed, from some spectacle, and bringing a friend with him demanded supper with the tone of a spoiled boy who knew that his lightest word was law to all who surrounded him. The supper was brought with apparently all the delicacies he demanded, for he made no complaint, and having sent for all the most excellent wines in his ankle's cellar, he dismissed the servants and remained alone with his friend. Tossing about, restless and irritable, I was nearly frantic with their mirth and their gaiety, and could have willingly murdered them both to make them silent. But soon their conversation began to take a turn which interested even me. 
the youth who was evidently the entertainer and whom his companion named charles had for several minutes been expatiating with all the hyperbolical enthusiasm of youthful passion on some beautiful girl whom he had determined he said to marry let who would oppose it her name was mentioned by neither of the speakers their conversation referring to something that had passed before with the very natural pleasure which most people experience in finding all sorts of obstacles to whatever another person proposes the friend seemed bent upon suggesting difficulties in opposition to his companion's passion consider my dear charles said he this girl may be as beautiful as the day but from her father's situation her education must have been very much neglected not at all not at all replied the lover her education as far as learning and accomplishments go will shame the whole court and her manners are those of a princess of el dorado well i told you she has been brought up all her life by the countess de bigorre it may easily be supposed that such words did not tend to calm the beating of my heart and in the agitation caused by thus suddenly discovering that helen was the subject of their conversation i lost what passed next in a moment after however the lover replied to some question of his companion i do not very well know why her father took her away from the countess and brought her to paris i should have supposed that it would have been much more convenient to him in every respect to have her left where she was however i am his most humble and very obedient servant for i should never have seen her otherwise and marry her i will if i should carry her off for it but her birth charles her birth said his companion what will your uncle think of that he who is so proud of his own oh replied the hot-brained youth you know i can do anything with my uncle and besides this father of hers has been quietly accumulating a large fortune it seems one way or another and so that must cover the sin of her birth in my uncle's eyes but say what you will or what he will or what any one will i will marry her if i live to be a year older what and discharge the little epingliere jeannette replied his companion with a laugh oh that does not follow answered the other tis always well to have two strings to one's bow and jeannette is too charming to be parted with for these three years at least but madame ma femme will know nothing of mademoiselle ma bonne amie and i shall find her proud beauty the more delightful by contrasting it with the more modest charms of jeannette the more simple charms you mean not the more modest replied his companion i never heard that jeannette was famous for her modesty the opium draught which i had taken counteracted in its effects by the pain of my body and the irritation of my mind began to make me somewhat delirious strange shapes seemed flitting about my bed i saw faces looking at me out of the darkness and insulting me with fiendish grins at the same time the light way in which the weak young man in the next chamber spoke of helen of my sweet my beautiful helen worked me up to a pitch of frantic rage which mingling with the delirium of opium made me resolve to get up and avenge her upon the spot i accordingly raised myself in bed and after sitting upright for a moment or two with my brain seeming to whirl like the eddy of a stream i got out with infinite difficulty when the cold air and the chill of the stones to my feet in some degree recalled me to my senses and instead of groping for my sword as i intended i returned towards my bed but coming upon it sooner than i had expected i struck it with my knee fell over upon it and with the sort of despairing heedlessness of fever and wretchedness lay still where i had fallen till the opium overpowering me i lost all recollection of my misery in a deep and death-like slumber it was late ere i woke and when i did so it was with one of those dreadful headaches which seem to benumb every faculty of the mind and body while at the same time the bruises all over my left side were even more sensitively painful than the night before the first thing i heard was a woman's voice inquiring how i found myself and looking round i perceived a good-looking fattish nun of one of the charitable sisterhoods sitting in a chair by my bedside she seemed one of those good dames who attach themselves to great families and act as an inferior sort of almoner 
performing the part of charitable go-betweens attending the sick servants with somewhat more skill than an apothecary and more attention than a physician serving as head nurse to the lady of the mansion and acquiring much consequence with the poor by dispensing the bounty of the rich in answer to her question i replied that i was in very great pain both from a violent headache and the bruises i had received whereupon she immediately produced a phial from which the surgeon had the night before administered his sleeping draught intimating that i must take another portion to relieve me from what i suffered and informing me at the same time in a very oracular tone that it was not at all wonderful that my bones ached after sleeping all night naked on the outside of the bed as i attributed the excessive aching of my head entirely to the contents of the bottle she held in her hand i resisted magnanimously all her persuasions to take more of its contents for some time but at length her offended authority instigated her to such an outcry that i would have drunk phlegethon red hot to have quieted her i took accordingly what she gave and was about to have asked some questions in regard to my situation when she stopped me with a profoundly patronising air and told me that if i would promise to keep myself quite quiet and not agitate myself i should be favoured with a visit from a young lady who took an interest in me who who in the name of heaven cried i the idea of helen instantly flashing across my mind tell me tell me who use not heaven's name for such vanities young gentleman said the nun who the young lady is you will see directly and i have only to tell you that her father has granted her five minutes to converse with you for old friendship's sake and she hath promised that it shall be no more therefore you must not seek to stay her so saying she left me and in a moment after the door again opened and helen herself my own beautiful helen came forward towards me with a look of eager gladness that while it surprised me took a heavy load from off my heart she glided forward to my bedside laid her dear soft hand in mine after gazing a moment on my worn and haggard features burst into a flood of tears dear dear helen said i then you love me still and ever will louis answered she speaking through her tears whatever they may say whatever they may think i will love you still louis and no one but you only tell me that you love me also and not another as they would have me believe and nothing shall shake the affection that i have ever borne towards you love another cried i helen you have never believed them for a moment for heaven's sake tell me that such a base suspicion never for an instant made any impression on your heart i never believed it louis answered she for i never believed that anything base could for a moment harbour in your bosom and yet it gave me pain i knew not why but let me tell you what has happened to me personally during your absence i cannot tell you my father's motives for i do not know them but i can tell you oh no no helen cried i shrinking from the detail of what must have followed the discovery of her brother's death and beginning to doubt that she attributed it to me oh no no dear helen spare me all that unhappy detail i chanced to overhear last night from some person speaking in that chamber that your father had come and taken you from the protection of my mother i easily conceived his reasons i heard all i heard everything by that conversation last night and all that now needs explanation is how any one could dare to tell you that i loved another indeed louis many believed it every one i may say but myself helen replied but the time i am allowed to remain grows short before anything else let me communicate to you what my father bade me say for him if you wish to see him he says he will see you but you must be prepared if he does so to explain to him every part of your conduct and to show him that the blood which he cannot help attributing to you rests not on your head forgive me louis oh forgive she continued seeing me turn deadly pale i pain you i see i pain you but it was only on condition that i would deliver this cruel message that they would permit me to see you it is not i that ask you louis to do anything that is painful to you i am sure 
i am certain you are not guilty i cannot i will not believe it but my father will not see you without you can explain it all can you then dear louis will you see him helen i cannot replied i she gazed at me for a moment in silence hark they call me she said at length oh louis before i go say something to comfort me say something to sustain in my breast that confidence of your innocence which has been my consolation and my hope all i can say dear helen replied i is that in wish and intention i was as innocent as you are but that accident has made me appear culpable and that i have nothing but my own word to prove that i was not purposely guilty but your own word is enough for me answered helen catching i believe gladly at the assurance that could maintain her belief in my innocence i will believe it myself and i will try and make others believe it but i must leave you louis they are calling me again adieu adieu but helen dear helen you will see me again cried i struggling to raise myself promise me that most assuredly answered helen if they will allow me and obedient to a sign from the nun who had returned to the room while i was speaking she glided away and left me a thousand questions did i now ask the good sister but with a curious felicity of evasion she parried them all now with an affectation of mistaking me now with an ambiguous reply now with a refusal to answer like a skilled fencer who whether his adversary lunges straight forward or faints still finds some parade to guard his own breast and repel the attack in all its forms not a word could i extract from her on any subject whereupon i wished information and gradually the drowsiness of the opium began to take away the power of questioning her any farther from what i have learned since i am led to believe that the good lady in administering the sleeping potion which she had deafened me into taking had poured out at least double what was ordered by the surgeon at all events its effect was much more rapid and powerful than the night before for with all the busy thoughts which my interview with helen might well suggest with all the bitter remembrances it called up with all the painful anticipations to which it gave rise slumber came rapidly upon me and before half an hour had passed after her departure i fell into a deep sleep which a little more of the same sedative would probably have converted into the sleep of death end of chapter thirty one chapter thirty two of de lorme by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty two when i again awoke it was night but the darkness was not disagreeable to me i was easier in bodily sensation than i had been in the morning and i pleased myself with calling to mind every gentle word which my beloved helen had spoken with conjuring up again every sweet look and dreaming over that fond devoted affection which in the midst of the sorrows and uncomforts that surrounded me was like some guiding star to a voyager on the inhospitable ocean but then came the idea of seeing her father and i thought even if she could convince him of my innocence how could i clasp his hand with that which had slain his child i remembered my feelings towards him when entirely abandoning his sweet child to the care of my mother he seemed to have resigned all his paternal rights and it had been only my respect for helen which had saved him from my unconcealed contempt i remembered too his long nourished dislike towards me and i asked myself whether he would feel it less now that he could not but suspect me of the death of his son yet still his pride might be gratified to ally his child to the house of bigor and to see his descendants attached to that noble class to which he could not himself aspire but then again if he had really accumulated so much wealth as the conversation i had overheard had intimated he could easily match his daughter with so rich a dower of beauty as well as gold amongst families as noble as my own where no such fearful objections existed as that which interposed between helen and myself what needed i more the weak youth of whose passion for her i had been made an unwitting confidant 
with evidently high birth and proud connections, stood ready to unite himself to the daughter of the low procureur of Lourdes, and give her that rank and station which I doubted not that Arnaud coveted. Helen, I was sure, would never consent, and yet I teased myself with the dread, fancying all that perseverance and the persuasions and commands of a parent might do against an almost hopeless love. While I thus alternately solaced myself with dwelling upon all the sweetness, the beauty, the affection of her I loved, and tormenting myself with imagining all that might separate us, epitomizing in one short hour the many fluctuating hopes and fears of a long human life, to my surprise the darkness became less opaque, and by the grey which gradually mingled with the black, I found that morning was imperceptibly stealing upon night, so that my slumber must have lasted more than twenty hours. But a still greater surprise awaited me. Gradually, as the day dawned, one object after another struck me as resembling the furniture of the little room which I had tenanted ever since I had quitted the inn after my arrival in Paris. Was I dreaming still? Or had I dreamed? I asked myself. Had all I had seen during the last two days been but a delusion? Or was I still labouring under some deception of my imagination? But no, with the clear daylight it became evident that I was there, in the little chamber I had hired in the Rue des Prêtres Saint-Paul. There was the carved scrutoire, with its thousand grotesque heads. There the old table, which had acknowledged more than one dynasty. There lay my clothes, my hat, my sword, as if I had left them there on going to bed the night before, and nothing served to show that the whole that I have lately described was not a dream, except the bruises on my shoulder and my side, which smacked somewhat painfully of reality. In about an hour afterwards my good landlady came in, to ask if I wanted anything, and from her I learned that I had been brought home on a litter still sound asleep, by some persons she did not know who told her I had met with an accident, and bade her take great care of me, enforcing their injunction with a piece of gold. This was an effort of liberality on the part of Arnaud which I had not expected, either from his own character, which was notedly avaricious, or from the general rule of nature, that the long habit of accumulating small sums narrows the heart and leaves no room for any generous feeling. I began to feel that I had been mistaken in his character, and I tried, fondly, to persuade myself with a theory, as fallacious as any other of those fallacious things, theories, that the father of so noble-spirited a girl as Helen, whose whole soul was liberality, and her very thought of feeling, must, in some degree, partake of the same nature, and possess hidden qualities which, when called into action, would shine out and assert their kindred my good landlady in common with all old women had a strange prejudice in favour of keeping those she looked upon as sick in bed but in spite of all her persuasions i got up and dressed myself my first care was to examine what money i had left after the sad dilapidation which the gaming-table had effected on my purse though indeed i expected to find that the tender-hearted gentleman who had thrown me out of the window had charitably taken care that the few crowns which had remained in my pocket should not weigh me down in my descent. My own purse, indeed, was gone, but in its place, to my no small surprise, I found one containing a hundred louis d'or. This, of course, had come from Arnaud, though how he came to know that I stood in need of such supply I could not divine. For some time I remained undetermined whether I should make use of the sum or not. Pride whispered that Arnaud had removed me from the neighbourhood of his daughter, possibly to marry her to someone else, and should I then accept the vile Roturier's bounty, his charity? At the same time, necessity urged that I had nothing but that, for the daily wants of life, that if I hoped ever to discover Helen's dwelling in that great city, and having done so, never again to lose sight of her, I must have the aid of that talismanic metal, whose touch discovers and secures and perfects everything but a moment's reflection made me regard the question with better feelings arnaud had removed me from his daughter true but it was because he believed me to be the murderer of his son and he was therefore justified in doing so 
he had placed the money where I found it, probably not out of charity, for he knew that I could easily repay it ultimately, but to relieve me from a temporary necessity. There was yet another supposition. Perhaps Helen had placed it there herself. Pride between me and Helen was out of the question, and there was something so sweet in the very idea of following her wishes, even though she knew it not, that I should have looked upon hesitation after that supposition crossed my mind, as the meanest of vanities. I determined then to make use of the money thus placed at my disposal, and to reimburse the donor, if I know, at a future period. If Helen had been the giver, to repay her whenever I could discover her abode by telling her I had used it well. The effort of dressing had caused me a great deal of pain, and while I sat down to rest myself afterwards, I sent a boy to inquire at my inn in the Rue de Prouvaire whether my little friend Achilles had appeared there during my absence. In about an hour I heard the rush of feet galloping up the stairs, with the rapidity of joy. The door flew open, and in rushed Achilles, but no longer the Achilles I had left him. The smart Spanish dress of which he had possessed himself at Barcelona was gone. The hat, the plume, the sword had given way to all the external signs of poverty and want. His head was as bare as when he came into the world, and his shoulders were covered with a grey gown which had once belonged to a monk. The fashion of it, indeed, had been somewhat altered, for the cowl had been made serviceable in patching several momentous rents, which might otherwise have exposed the little man's person somewhat more than decency permitted. "'Well, Achilles,' said I, when, the first transport of his joy at finding me having passed away, I could find an opportunity of speaking. "'You seem to have been engaged in traffic since I saw you, and not to have gained upon the exchange.' "'Oh, you will pardon me, monsieur,' replied he, grinning as merrily as ever. "'I have gained a vast fund of experience. I know that is a sort of commodity the returns upon which are slow, but they are very sure.' and I will try to make the most of it. But from what I see, rejoined I, with somewhat, I am afraid, of a cynical sneer at the light-heartedness which I could not myself acquire, I am afraid you paid very dear for your bargain. Not cheap, I confess, replied he. Somewhere about three hundred pistoles, a good suit, a dozen shirts, and a whipping through the streets of Lyon, that is all. A whipping? cried I. That is a part of the account I did not reckon upon, and not one of the most pleasant, I should conceive. But come, Achilles, let us hear your story. It must be somewhat curious. Not very, answered Achilles, but it is short, which is something in favour of the story. After your lordship's departure, I embarked in the boat for Lyon, as soon as it thought fit to sail, and we began our long, slow voyage up the river, which at first was very tedious. Soon, however, I hit upon a way of amusing myself, for seeing a respectable old merchant of Lyon with a young lady, whom I took to be his daughter, I went up and introduced myself to them as Monsieur le Comte de Grimagnac, told them that, preferring the easy gliding motion of the river to the rumbling of a carriage, or the jolting of a horse, I had sent my equipage and servants by land, and instantly began to make love to the daughter. The old gentleman seemed so uneasy at the advances that I made in her favour that I began to fear he suspected me, and to do away all doubt, when we stopped to dine, I took a handful of gold out of my pocket, and asked what was to pay, with the air of a prince. The young lady seemed ravished with the sight of the gold pieces, but my old merchant grew more uneasy than ever, and always got between me and the young lady when I wanted to speak to her so that I began to grow suspicious in my turn, and to doubt whether the tie between them was not somewhat more tender than the relationship. This doubt induced me to watch the pair more diligently than ever, for she was as beautiful a girl as ever your worship set your worshipful eyes upon, and the old gentleman as venerable an old piece of withered bamboo as ever fell into sin in his dotage so you may easily conceive I could not bear to see such a rosebud withering upon such a desert. Well, this went on with various success till we arrived at Lyon, and I cannot say my fair Phyllis was at all inclined to second her guardian's efforts to repulse me. 
so that we had time to arrange that i should go to the auberge of the lion d'or on our disembarkation and there wait a note from my fair enslaver to the lion d'or i went and soon received a summons to fly to my charmer whom i found as her billet doux intimated waiting for me in a very respectable lodging in the rue saint pierre here her face half in tears half in smiles like the opening of an april morning she told me that she had now no friend but me for that her cruel tyrant the instant of their arrival had commanded her to abandon me for ever this the passion i had inspired her with would not permit and being too frank she said to deceive any one she had at once refused a quarrel ensued he had cast her off penniless and though she could instantly fly to the baron de cumois or the marquis de la soupierre she had preferred putting herself under my protection for she owned that she never loved any one but me though this was as sweet as honey yet as i well perceived that with such a charmer's assistance my dearly beloved pistoles would soon fly half over lyons i bethought myself seriously of the best means of transferring her with all speed to the marquis de la soupierre however to lull all suspicion of the waning state of my affection i prepared to entertain her handsomely till good luck should furnish me with the means of beating a quiet retreat and accordingly sent to the traiteurs for a good dinner as the very best means of consoling a distressed damsel over rich ragout and heady burgundy the hours slipped lightly by and i could see in my little phyllis's sparkling eye her satisfaction with the conquest she had made alas that mortal joy should be so transitive in the midst of our happiness care and melancholy and gloom and despite rushed suddenly upon us in the form of four ferocious archers who pitilessly arrested phyllis on the charge of having robbed her former venerable protector and hurried me to prison along with her as an accomplice phyllis had taken care to hide the place of her retreat but she knew not the cunning of archers and though when they came she protested her innocence in terms that would have convinced the hard heart of minos and won the unwilling ears of radamanthus yet as the whole of the stolen goods were found in her valise the unfeeling archers would not believe a word and as i have said before we were both hurried to prison without any farther ceremony than taking from us every farthing that we had in the world the next morning we were brought before a magistrate who reserved phyllis's case for his private consideration as to mine as nothing could be proved against me except that i had called myself the count de grilmagnac without being able clearly to prove all my quarters of nobility i was ordered to be whipped through the town for my ignorance of heraldry and then discharged my whipping i bore with christian fortitude but the loss of my doublet which the executioner kept for his fee and the loss of my money which the archers kept because they liked it tore my heart-strings and setting out from that accursed town of lyons where injustice and cruelty walk hand in hand i begged my way to paris and reached the famous hotel where you had appointed me to meet you there the landlord told me no such person as your lordship resided and bade me get out for a lazy beggar a black dog that stood in the yard instantly took up the matter where the landlord left off and i was in the act of making my escape from them both when the boy you sent arrived inquiring for me the joy which took possession of my heart i need not tell suffice it that i made the boy run all the way here and that having now found you i have determined never to leave you or let you leave me again for while we were together nothing but good fortune attended us and since we have been separated nothing but ill luck has been my share so that the only consolation i can have will be to hear that while my scale was down yours has been up and that dame fortune has at least befriended one of us i could not refuse to tell my history also to my little attendant though it occasioned less amusement to him than his had done to me and his face grew longer and longer at every incident i detailed till at last passing over all that regarded helen i informed him that on being conveyed home i found my pocket encumbered with a hundred louis this news instantly cleared his countenance 
who would not be thrown out of window for a hundred louis cried he but vive dieu your excellency has suffered yourself to be desperately cheated in regard to your ring six louis if i know anything of diamonds it was well worth thirty however let me first exercise my chirurgical skill upon your eminence's shoulder and after that i will see whether the ring cannot be recovered nay nay cried i my good achilles give me what titles of honour you like except your eminence that is a rank which it might be dangerous to usurp call me your majesty if you like but not your eminence as to the ring i believe you are right and i will willingly give double what i received to recover it again less than that will do replied achilles a louis for me to buy myself a suit at a fripier's a louis for an archer de la cour and the sum you had originally received and i think i can manage it i warned him if i may use the homely proverb not to go forth to shear and come home shorn and having suffered him to examine my shoulder gave him the address of the jeweller and let him depart from my lodging as he told me afterwards he went to the shop of the fripier where he furnished himself with a decent suit of livery and thence proceeded to find out an archer of one of the courts of justice to whom he explained the affair and gave half a louis as earnest promising the other half if the ring should be recovered the eloquence of the little player touched the tender heart of the archer at the same moment that the money touched his palm and shouldering his partisan without more ado he followed to the shop of the jeweller achilles entered alone and desiring to see some diamond rings made up a slight allegory to suit the occasion informing the jeweller that his master the count de lorme had commissioned him to buy him a handsome jewel as a present for his mistress the jeweller instantly produced a case of rings which he spread out before the eyes of achilles commenting on their beauty achilles instantly pitched upon the one i had sold and asked the price forty louis replied the jeweller and i only sell it so cheap because i bought it second hand i require no more than a fair profit if i gain five per cent may i be branded for a rogue i will tell you a secret jeweller replied achilles you are very lucky to be branded for a rogue you bought this ring knowing it to be stolen the jeweller stared it was taken from the person of my noble lord the count de lorme proceeded achilles when he was knocked down and robbed in the rue saint jacques one of the thieves is taken the very one who sold it to you a tall dark young man with curling hair black moustache and a beard not six months old he says you gave him six louis for it and as you know it to be worth forty you must have been very well aware when you bought it that it was stolen ho oh, oh, ho cried the jeweller so you wish to cheat me out of my ring but come my little man he continued catching achilles by the collar i will send for an archer and see you safe lodged in prison without farther ado achilles according to his own account took the matter very calmly as to the archer he said to the jeweller i thought to myself before i came here that a man who gave but six louis for a diamond worth thirty might be somewhat refractory and therefore i brought one with me ho archer without there the jeweller not a little confounded instantly let go achilles's collar and as the archer marched in with his partisan began to shake in every limb doubtless aware that all his dealings would not bear that strict examination which they were likely to undergo if chance should call the prying eyes of the law upon them i take you to witness archer said achilles addressing his ally that i have offered this jeweller the same price which the young man swears he got for this ring namely six louis and that he the jeweller will not sell it for less than forty which proves that he knew it to be stolen certainly said the archer in a solemn tone you never offered me the six louis said the jeweller i never said i would not part it for under forty give me the six and take it and the devil give you good for it for it is not worth more then you are a great rogue for having asked forty replied achilles with imperturbable composure and therefore he entered into solemn consultation with the archer as to whether he could safely and legally give the money and take back the ring as it was evident the jeweller was an accomplice to thieves and ought to be brought to justice gentlemen cried the terrified jeweller at length 
alarmed at all the awful catalogue of pros and cons which Achilles and the archer banded about between them. I declare, on my salvation, I knew nothing of the ring being stolen. I thought the person who brought it here was some poor gentleman pressed for money, who would sell it for anything, and therefore I offered six louis for it. All I asked back is what I gave, and I am content to present this worthy archer with a gold piece to compensate the trouble he has had. Give him the money, said the archer. Give him the money and take the ring. We must not be too hard upon the poor devil. The money was accordingly given. The archer received his fee, and Achilles carried off the ring to me in triumph, not only having had the satisfaction of biting the biter, but also having won the warm friendship of an archer of the court of aids, which, to a man of his principles and practice, was a most invaluable acquisition. End of chapter 32Chapter thirty three of Delorme by G. P. R. James. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirty three. Achilles, on his return, amused me with the account I have just given, while he rubbed my shoulder with some ungent bought for the purpose, and though I was not over well pleased at having been played off as a robber, with so particular a description also as he had given of my person, yet I was not at all sorry that the jeweller had been pinched for his roguery, and not a little rejoiced with the recovery of my ring. As I have before said, the little player, though as cunning as a sharper in some matters, was in others as simple as a child, and, like a boy with his first crown piece, fortune never gave him any sum, however small, but he seemed to think it inexhaustible. Thus, from time to time, he found so many delightful ways of employing my hundred louis, that had I followed his advice, one single day would have seen me at the end of all my riches. But I soon put a stop to the building of his castles in the air, by informing him that I intended to live in the most rigid economy, till such time as I had an opportunity of writing to my father, at the same time begging him to make up his mind to follow my example, if he still held his intention of remaining with me. "'Oh, very well, monsieur, very well,' cried he gaily. "'Anything contents me. "'I can live upon ortolans and stewed eels, "'but I do not object to onion soup and a crust of bread. "'Nay, when the soup cannot be had, the crust must serve.' "'Having arranged in my own mind "'all my plans for pursuing my economical system "'as strictly as possible, "'I sat down to the long-deferred task of writing to my father.' for now that i had seen helen half the difficulty was removed no matter what were the contents of the letter which i wrote it never went posts in those days were not the regular mechanical contrivances which our present glorious monarch has instituted for the purpose of facilitating the communication of every part of his dominions with the others couriers indeed passed to and fro from one part of the empire to another carrying the letters of individuals as well as the dispatches of state but all the arrangements concerning them were much in the same state as louis the eleventh had left them their departure from paris was at uncertain and irregular times and their journeys were generally directed towards the principal cities having either commercial or political relations with the capital the difficulty therefore of conveying anything to a remote and little frequented part of the empire delayed my letter for some time, and before an opportunity presented itself, circumstances had changed. In the meanwhile I employed my mornings in searching for the mansion wherein I had seen Helen, but although aided by all the wit of little Achilles, to whom I communicated enough information to guide him on his search, I wandered through the streets of Paris in vain, watching the opening gates of every large hotel I saw, in the hope of beholding the livery in which the servants I had seen were dressed, and forcing my recollection to recall the appearance of the archway under which I had been carried, till a thousand times I deceived myself into hope, and as often encountered disappointment. Once only I thought myself sure of the discovery. The porte cochere of a house near the Place Royale struck me as the very same I had passed, while borne upon the brancard by the servants. Every ornament, every pillar was there, as far as I could remember. 
There were the curious Gothic mouldings upon which the torchlight had flashed as we passed through. There were the two immense couchant bears carved in stone on each side of the arch, on the back of one of which the bearers had rested the litter, while the companions opened the gates. Everything seemed the same, and taking my stand under the porch of the monastery of the Minims, I kept watch for two hours till a servant coming out showed me, to my surprise, a livery totally different from that which I had both hoped and expected to see. I may be asked what was my object in thus seeking for Helen, when I knew, when I felt that my union with her was impossible, when at the very thought her brother's spirit seemed to rise up before me, and, with the same ghastly look which he had worn in death, bid me forget such hopes for ever. Why did I seek her? No one that has loved will ever ask. I sought her for the bright, brief happiness which the presence of the loved still gives, after every expectation is crushed and withered. I sought her with that dreamy sort of lingering with which a mother hangs over the frail clay of her dead child. My hopes were blighted, my happiness was gone, and yet the very object that most nourished my regret was that on which I could look most fondly, and which I sought with the most anxious, most unremitting care. Thus passed my mornings in fruitless search and continual disappointment. My evenings flew in a different manner, not in studying the sure way of winning, or in practising its precepts, for such a horror had seized me of that hell-invented vice, gaming, and of all that appertains to it, that my first care had been to throw the book I had bought into the fire. The temporary passion which had seized me, I looked upon, and can almost look upon now, as a fit of insanity, for taught as I had been from my infancy to abhor its very name, nothing but absolute madness could have hurried me to a vice at once so degrading and so dangerous, which, as far as regards the mind, is, in fact, at best, a combination of avarice and frenzy. I had now bought myself a variety of books on military tactics, and without any defined purpose in the study, I spent my whole evenings in poring over these treatises of attack and defence, a greater and a nobler species of gambling than that which I had quitted, it is true, but only less mad inasmuch as it is a game which any one nation can compel another to play, and where those must lose who have not studied to win. I also went occasionally to a hall that an Italian fencer had fitted up in the Rue Pavé, for the purpose of turning a high reputation he had acquired in Europe into ready money. Here the room, which was furnished with all sorts of arms offensive and defensive, was well lighted every night, and the assembled company either formed practising parties amongst themselves, or took lessons from the Italian himself, who was one of the most athletic men I ever beheld, and certainly a most complete master of his weapons. My father, I have said, was perhaps the most skilful swordsman of his day, and he had taken care that his son should not be wanting in an accomplishment in which he was such a proficient. I was therefore certainly more than equal in point of skill to any one who frequented the Italian's hall, and very nearly a match for himself. This, however, seemed rather to give him pleasure than otherwise, and whenever I entered he saluted me with the respect which he enthusiastically imagined due to every one skilful in the noble science of arms, frequently inviting me to stretch my limbs with him in an assault, and taking a delight in showing me all the minute refinements of his art. This was the sole diversion I allowed myself, though while I mingled with the crowds where I knew no one, and wandered through the streets where I was a stranger, a sad feeling of loneliness, of miserable desolation, crept over my heart, and I returned to my lodging in the evening, grave, melancholy, and discontented. Although there were now several companies of actors continually at Paris, to the play I never went, that being a sort of amusement too costly for the narrow bounds to which I had restrained my expenses, and, indeed, so strictly economical was I in all my habits, that my good landlady began to fancy me in want, and to show her commiseration for my condition, by all those little delicate pieces of charity which a person who has felt both pride and suffering knows how to evince towards those whose spirit has not yet wholly bowed to its fate. Any little delicacy which fell in her way 
she would add it to the breakfast that achilles brought me from the traiteurs nor did she ever ask for her rent but rather avoided me on those days when it became due though i believe in truth she needed it not a little i understood her motives and though i did not choose to undeceive her i took care that she should not be a loser by the kindness which she showed me finding in her also a delicacy of feelings and refinement of conversation which were above her station i would sometimes when any chance led me to speak with her endeavour to ascertain whether her situation had ever been more elevated than that which she at present filled and on one of these occasions she told me gratuitously that she had been in former years governante to the beautiful henriette de verne whose private marriage with the count de bagnol i have already mentioned more than once she was surprised to find that i was acquainted with so much of the history of which she knew very little more herself as i was found to have been privy to the marriage said she i was sent away directly and denied all communication with my young lady after it was discovered but i saw the bloody spot where the poor count was slain and the dents of the feet where the struggle had passed and a fearful struggle it must have been for two of the marquis of st brie's men remained ill at the village for weeks afterwards and no one was allowed to see them but his own surgeon one of them died also and his confession was said to be so strange that the priest sent to rome to know how far he was justified in keeping it secret after that i came to paris and i heard no more of the family which all went to ruin except indeed some one told me that my young lady died shortly afterwards in a convent at arch as i was of course anxious to transmit the papers which chance had placed in my hands to any of the surviving members of the count de bagnol's family i inquired particularly what information she could give me concerning them but she was more ignorant of everything relating to them than even myself one morning on my return from my vain searching after helen i was surprised on being informed that a stranger had inquired for me during my absence and had begged the landlady to inform me that he would call again in the evening where reason has no possible clue to guide her through the labyrinth of any doubt she pauses at the gate while imagination seems to step the more boldly in and as if in mockery of her timid companion sports through every turning till she either finds the track by accident or tired of wandering through the inexplicable maze she spreads her dedalian wings and soars above the walls that would confine her i had no cause to believe that one person sought me more than another and yet my fancy set to work as busily as if i had the most certain data to reason from my first thoughts immediately returned to arnaud and my next to the chevalier de montenero and so strange was the ascendancy which the last had gained over my mind that the very idea of meeting with him inspired me with as much joy as if all my difficulties had been removed but the description given in answer to my inquiries at once put to flight such a supposition the stranger my landlady informed me was evidently a clergyman by his dress and by his manner and appearance she guessed him to be one of a distinguished rank it was therefore evidently neither the chevalier nor arnaud and the only supposition i could form upon the subject was that the cardinal de richelieu had at length deigned to take some notice of me my disposition was naturally impatient of all expectation and the dull heaviness of the last week which i had passed day after day in the same fruitless pursuit had worked me up to a pitch of irritable anxiety which people of a different temperament can hardly imagine i wearied imagination i exhausted conjecture i hoped i feared i doubted till day waned and night came and giving up all expectation of seeing this stranger that evening i cursed him heartily for having said he would come and not keeping his word and sat down once more to my theory of tactics i had scarcely however got through one quarter of a campaign when the rapid motion of achilles's feet on the stair announced news of some kind and in a moment after he threw open the door giving admission to a stranger the person who entered was not much older than myself he was tall and apparently well made but his clerical dress served him a good deal in this respect concealing a pair of legs which were somewhat clumsy 
and not the straightest in the world. His head was one of the finest I have ever seen, and his face without, perhaps possessing one feature that was regularly handsome, except the full rounded chin and the broad expanse of forehead, instantly struck and pleased, giving the idea of great powers of mind joined with a light and brilliant wit that sparkled playfully in his clear dark eye. He bowed low as he entered and advanced towards a seat, which I begged him to take with that quietness of motion which, without being stealthy, is silent and calm, and is ever a sign of high breeding and good society. I made Achilles a sign to withdraw, and expressing myself honoured by the stranger's visit, begged to know whether I was to attribute it to any particular object, or merely to his kind politeness towards a stranger. "'If there were any kindness in doing a pleasure to oneself,' replied the stranger, "'I would willingly take the credit of it, but in the present instance, as the gratification is my own, I cannot pretend to any merit. This answer was somewhat too vague to satisfy me, and I replied that I was fully sensible of the honour done me, and would have much pleasure in returning his visit when I knew where I might have the opportunity. My method of receiving him, as equal with equal, seemed, I thought, somewhat to surprise him, for, half closing his eyes, in a manner which seemed common to him, he glanced round my small apartment with a scrutinising look, too brief to be impertinent, and yet too remarking to escape my notice. "'I shall esteem myself honoured by your visit,' replied he at length. "'I am but a poor abbé. My name, Jean de Gondy, and you will find me for the present at the house of my uncle, the Duke de Retz.' It was, indeed, the famous abbé, afterwards Cardinal de Retz, with whom I was then in conversation. Not yet three and twenty years of age, he had already acquired one of the most singular reputations that ever man possessed. Daring, intriguing, and ambitious, nothing daunted him in his enterprises, nothing repelled him in their course. Storms and tumults were his element, and when, before he was seventeen, he wrote his famous conjuration de fiesque he seemed to point out the scene in which he was himself destined to act to which nature prompted him from the first and circumstances called him in the end in the manner there was a strange mixture of calm suavity thoughtless vivacity policy frankness and pride which combined together served perhaps better to cover his immediate motives and hide his real character than the appearance of any uniform habit of mind which he could have assumed. All men contain within themselves strange contradictions, but he was the only one I ever knew who, upon the most mature reflection, acted in continual contradiction to himself. He would often put in practice the most consummate strokes of policy to gain a trifle, or to satisfy an appetite, and he would commit the most egregious follies and effect the most extravagant passions, to hide the shrewdest political schemes and conceal the best calculated and most subtle enterprises he was a man on whom one could never calculate with certainty it seemed his pleasure to disappoint whatever expectations had been formed of him and yet to hear him reason one would have judged that the slightest action of his life was regulated by strong conclusions from fixed unvarying principles I had heard his character from many others, as well as from the Marquis de Saint-Brie, but as this last gentleman had calculated, when he sketched it to me, that my life would be limited to three days at the utmost, he could have had no possible motive in deceiving me. With this knowledge of his character, then, it required no great discernment to see that the visit of de Retz was not without an object, and resolving, if it were possible, to ascertain precisely what that object was, I bowed on his announcing himself, and said, "'Of course, Monsieur de Retz, it is needless for me to give you my name. You were certainly aware of that before you did me the honour of this visit.' "'No, indeed,' replied he. "'I am perfectly ignorant both of your name and rank, though by your appearance, and all I have heard of you, I can have no doubt in regard to the latter. The truth is, I was informed by persons on whom I could depend.' that a young gentleman of singularly prepossessing appearance and manners had taken this apartment, and was supposed to be under some temporary difficulty. I turned very red, I believe, but he proceeded, 
People will talk of their neighbours' affairs, you know, and tis useless to be angry with them. But hearing this, as I have said, I felt an irresistible impulse to visit you, and to render you any assistance in my power. Nor will I regret it, even if I have been misinformed, inasmuch as it has gained me the pleasure of your acquaintance. With such a speech there was no possible means of being offended, though I felt not a little angry at my affairs having been made matters of commiseration throughout the town. I was rather inclined to believe, also, that the trouble which M. de Retz had given himself did not originate entirely in benevolence. I did not doubt that charity might have had some part therein, for he had acquired a reputation, which I believe he deserved, for generous feeling towards the sufferings of his fellow creatures. But the motives of men are so mixed that it is in vain tracing their original source. Like a giant stream, the course of human action arises very often in five or six different fountains, each of which has nearly the same right as the others to be considered the head. And, besides this, in flowing on from its commencement to its end, it receives the accession of a thousand other different currents, so that at the last not one drop in a million is pure water which welled from any individual source. I was sure, therefore, of doing M. de Retz no great injustice in supposing that his benevolence might be tinged with other feelings. And I replied, I should be sorry, sir, that a mistake had given you the trouble of coming here, did I not derive so much benefit from that false rumour. My name is the Count de Lorme, and I am happy that the bounty you propose to exercise upon me may be turned towards some other person more needing and deserving it than I do. Be not offended, Monsieur de Lorme, replied de Retz, at a mistake which has nothing in it dishonouring. Poverty is much oftener a virtue than wealth. But your name strikes me. De Lorme! Surely that was not the name of the young gentleman that his highness the Count de Soissons expected to join him from Berne. Oh, no, I remember. It was Count Louis de Bigorre. But no less the same person, replied I, with an unspeakable joy at seeing the clouds break away that had hung over my fate, at finding myself known and expected where I had fancied myself solitary amongst millions. I felt as if at those few words I leapt over the barrier which had confined me to my own loneliness, and mingled once more in the society of my fellows. I have always, continued I, been called Count Louis de Bigorre, but circumstances induced me, when I left my father's house, to assume the title which really belongs to the eldest son of the Counts of Bigorre. Monsieur de Retz saw that there was some mystery in my conduct, and he applied himself to discover my secret with an art and industry which would have accomplished much greater things. Nor did I take any great pains to conceal it from him. It is astonishing how weakly the human heart opens to any one who brings it glad news. The citadel of the mind throws wide all its gates to receive the messenger of joy, and takes little heed to secure the prisoners that are within. In the course of half an hour my new acquaintance had made himself acquainted with the greater part of my history, and when I began to think of putting a stop to my communication, I found that the precaution was of no use. The moment, however, that he saw me begin to retire into myself, he turned the conversation again to the Count de Soissons, whom he advised me to seek without further loss of time. "'You will find in him,' said he, "'all that is charming in human nature.' In his communion with society he had but one fault originally, which was great haughtiness. He knew that it was a fault, and has had the strength of mind to vanquish it completely, so that you will see in him one of the most affable men that France can boast. In regard to his private character you must make your own discoveries. A great mass of man's mind, like the greater part of his body, he takes care to cover so that no one shall judge of its defects except they be very prominent. And there are, thank God, as few that have hump-backed minds as hump-backed persons. Indeed, it has become a point of decency to conceal everything but the face, even of the mind, and none but Tatadamalia and sans culotte ever suffer it to appear in its nakedness. To follow my figure, then, Monsieur le Comte is always well dressed, so that you will find it difficult to know him. But, however, it is not for me to undress him for you. Take my advice. Set out for Sedan to-morrow, where, of course, you know he is, 
driven from his country by the tyrannizing spirit of our detested and detestable cardinal i rather think the count intends to initiate you somewhat deeply into politics but that must be his own doing also break your fast with me to-morrow and i will give you letters and more information is it an engagement i accepted the invitation with pleasure and having answered one or two questions which i put to him monsieur de retz left me for the night End of chapter 33chapter thirty four of de lorme by g p r james this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty four before i proceed farther with my own narrative it may be as well to take a slight review of the history of the count de soissons whose fate had a great effect upon the course of my whole future life nor is it here unworthy of remark how strangely events are brought about by providence while we walk blind and darkling through this misty existence groping our way onward on a path from which we cannot deviate an accidental word a casual action will change the whole current of life make a hermit of a monarch and a monarch of a shepherd as we sometimes see near the head of a stream a small hillock that a dwarf could stride turn the course of a mighty river far from the lands it flowed towards at first and send its waters wandering over the other countries to kingdoms and oceans and hemispheres afar the ancient county of vendome was in the year fifteen fifteen erected into a duchy by francis i in favour of charles de bourbon a direct lineal descendant from robert count de clermont fifth son of saint louis charles de bourbon thus duke of vendome left five sons only two of whom had children antoine the elder and louis the younger the first by his marriage with jeanne d'albret became king of navarre and left one only son who by default of the line of valois succeeded to the crown of france under the title of henri iv louis the younger brother became prince of conde and having been twice married left a family by each wife by his first marriage descended the branch of Condé, and by the second he left one son, Charles, Count de Soissons, whose son Louis is the prince referred to in the foregoing pages. Setting out in life with great personal activity and address, immense revenues, considerable talents and high rank, it is little to be wondered at that the young Count de Soissons, under the management of a weak, an indulgent and a proud mother, should grow up with the most revolting haughtiness of character from morning till night he heard of nothing but his own praises or his own rank and by the time he was eighteen his pride of demeanour was so repulsive and insupportable that it was a common saying that no one saw the count de soissons twice for if he did not dislike them and forbid them to return they were disgusted with him and would not go back but as the fault was more in his education than in his disposition its very excess corrected itself he gradually found himself avoided by those whom heaven had designed for his companions and sometimes even deserted by his very servants so that he was often left alone to enjoy his rank and dignity by himself under these circumstances he evinced qualities of mind far superior to the petty vice which shrouded it he had equally the wisdom to see that the fault lay in himself the judgment to discover in what that fault consisted and the energy to conquer it entirely not a trace of it remained in his manners nor did any of his actions but upon one occasion ever give cause to suppose that a touch of his former haughtiness rested even in the inner recesses of his heart with rare discrimination also of which few are master in the examination to which he subjected his own character he separated completely the good from the bad and took the utmost care to preserve that dignity of mind which is the best preservation against base and petty vices even while he cast from him the pride which is in itself a meanness many men in correcting themselves of the vices of a bad education would have felt some degree of bitterness towards the person to whose weakness that education and its vices were owing 
but towards his mother the count de soissons ever remained a pattern of filial affection consulting her wishes and inclination on every occasion where his own honour and character were not interested in opposing her the consequences of the change which he had effected in himself were not long in rewarding him for the effort he had made and in a very few years he found that affection followed him everywhere instead of hate the bright qualities of his mind and the graces of his person shone out with a new light like the glorious sun bursting through a cloud he was adored by the army loved by the people and princes were proud to be his friends at this time however the councils of france became embarrassed and disordered and it was difficult even to run one's course quietly through life so many were the dangers and evils that lurked about on all sides every step was upon an earthquake and few would keep their footing steadily to the end the cardinal de richelieu had already snatched the reins of government from the feeble hands that should have held them and saw before him a wide field of power and aggrandizement with few to oppose his putting in the sickle and reaping to his heart's content the power the wealth the popularity of the count de soissons gave him the opportunity of so opposing had he been so minded and richelieu was not a man to live in fear he resolved therefore to win him or to crush him to win him offered most advantages if it could be accomplished and deeming also that it would be more easy than the other alternative richelieu resolved to attempt it for this purpose he united in one circean cup everything that he fancied could tempt the ambition or passions of him he sought to gain by a confidential messenger he proposed to the count the hand of his favourite niece the duchess d'aquillon offering as her dower an immense sum of ready money the reversion of all his own enormous possessions the sword of constable of france and what provincial government the count might choose and doubtless he deemed such an offer irresistible not so to the count de soissons who conceived himself insulted by the proposal and the only spark of his ancient haughtiness that remained breaking forth into a flame he struck the messenger for daring to propose the hand of marie de vignerot widow of a mean provincial gentleman to a prince of the blood royal of france contemned and rejected personal resentment became added to the other motives which urged richelieu to the destruction of the count de soissons personal resentments never slept with him they lived while he lived nor were they ever weakened by sickness and approaching death no means but one existed of gratifying his animosity towards the count de soissons which was to implicate him with some of the conspiracies which were every day breaking forth against the tyranny of the government but even this was difficult for though living with princely splendour the count continued to reside in the midst of the court where all his actions were open and nothing could be attributed to him on which to found an accusation hatred however is ingenious a thousand petty vexations were heaped upon him and in the end even personal insult was added but without effect the count firmly resisted all the temptations which were held out to him to sully himself with any of the intrigues of the day the solicitations of his friends or the persecutions of his enemies were equally in vain and when human patience could no longer endure the grievances to which he was subjected at the court of france he left it for italy bearing with him the love and regret of the noblest of his countrymen a retreat however which left him free unstained and happy neither quieted the fears nor appeased the hatred of richelieu but forced to dissemble he gradually appeared to abandon his evil intentions invited the count to return and one by one made him such proposals as were likely to efface his former conduct without exciting suspicion by a sudden change the prince was not competent to cope with so deep an adept in the art of deceit and though still remembering with indignation the insults that had been offered him he suffered himself to be persuaded that they would not be repeated and returned to the court of france the minister lost no time and at length effected his object on his return the count found the best laws of the state defeated individual liberty lost and the public goods sacrificed to the particular interests of one ambitious man 
Richelieu took care that a thousand new affronts should mix a full portion of personal enmity with the Count's more patriotic feelings, and in the end the Prince suffered himself to be led into the conspiracy of Amiens. The weak and fickle Duke of Orléans had been placed in command over the Count de Soissons at the siege of Corby, and brought in closer union from this circumstance than they had ever been before, the two princes had various opportunities of communicating their grievances, and concerting some means of crushing the tyranny which at once affected themselves personally and the whole kingdom. There were not wanting many to urge that the assassination of the cardinal was the only sure way of terminating his dominion, but as the consent of the Count de Soissons could never be obtained to such a measure, it was determined to arrest the minister at the council at Amiens, and submit his conduct to the judgment of a legal tribunal. The irresolution of the Duke of Orléans suspended the execution of their purpose at the moment most favourable for effecting it, and before another opportunity presented itself the conspiracy was discovered, and the Duke of Orléans fled to Blois, while Monsieur le Comte, as the Count de Soissons was usually called, retired across the country to the strong town of Sedan, the gates of which were willingly thrown open to him by the Duke of Bouillon, who, though a vassal of France, still held that important territory between Luxembourg and Champagne, in full and unlimited sovereignty. Here the prince paused in security, well aware that Richelieu would never dare to attempt the siege of so strong a place as Sedan, while pressed on every side by the wars he himself had kindled and here also he was at the time of my arrival in paris though in a very different situation from that in which he at first stood in sedan chapter thirty four